It's Monday here in the North Shore Drive podcast from the Pittsburgh Post Gazette. I'm your host, Chris Carter. We're got, we've got a triple threat: Steelers, Pirates, and Penguins. While the Steelers are wrapping up their thir- their top thirty visits for the NFL draft, we'll look at who they might be prioritizing to give us a closer look at who's going to be their first round pick. Then the Pirates they they split the series with the Phillies. But Andrew McCutcheon's 300th home run was a special moment and included special moments with fans. We've got Noah Hiles in that case, and we've got Matt Benzel giving us his insight into the Penguins' chance at the playoffs. It's a triple threat North Shore Drive podcast. Let's get into it. You are now listening to the North Shore Drive podcast, a show on all things Pittsburgh sports from the writers of the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, hosted by Christopher Carter. Hello and welcome to the North Shore Drive podcast from the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. I'm your host, Chris Carter, here with Ray Fittipato, one of our great Steelers beat writers here at the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. As always, you can find all our written work at post-gazette.com, but find this podcast as well as all of our podcasting content on your favorite podcasting apps and on YouTube. Like this video if you enjoy it. Subscribe to this channel to get all the Monday, Wednesday, Friday episodes of this show, as well as the daily content that comes from all of our different sports writers. And as always, this show is brought to you by Mike's Beer Bar, the best bar in all of Pittsburgh. When you go to Mike's Beer Bar, you can, you can experience one of 500 different available beers. 300 of those beers are from the local Pittsburgh area, and 80 of those local beers are available on tap. It's the best place to go check out sporting events, and it's right across the street from PNC Park, making it the, the ultimate destination that you need to go to before or after Pirates games when you're coming to town. We'll talk more about them later, but Ray, now that we have had the week, this is the week before the draft. This is the last thing that's here. The Steelers can finish their top 30 visits. We I wanted to, you to give a look to, uh, to our audience here to see – you know how many more visits they have uh, remaining that they can bring they, they can bring in and that uh, that allows us to kind of look at who some of these last visits might be and give us more of an in- inkling into what their first round priorities will be yeah so chris they have seven more visits uh that they could offer and those will take place today tuesday and wednesday and um you know if you look at the first 23 or so they've been really heavy on offensive linemen defensive linemen, receivers, and corners. And I don't know that I would expect that to change all that much, you know, with with the last couple of visits. Um, I suppose you could say they could maybe draft an inside linebacker with, you know, a third or a fourth round pick. So maybe they'd bring some of those guys in, but I think it's going to be more the same. Um, I think you'll see probably a couple more centers come in, more corners, more receivers, and, and more tackles as well. That's kind of been their MO throughout this entire process. It seems seems like it. I want to look at some of the players that they've already looked at in other places, but you know, getting them in for a final top thirty visit could be you know a, another clincher here because you know we've talked about it before historically. If you have if you've been formally interviewed at the combine, if the Steelers have visited your pro day, the top brass have visited your pro day, and you're a top thirty visit, that gives you a that those are usually the guys the Steelers draft in the first round, and right now. There's only a few guys who qualify as having all three of that uh, right now. And right now, uh, the, the first was Nate Wiggins, the cornerback out of Clemson. The second was Amarius Mims, the tackle out of Georgia. And some of these guys also you know, can't kind of get that because they're the you know, West Coast guys. So they don't get the the full experience. Uh, you know, the, the, the Steelers don't the Steelers top brass won't go to the West Coast as pro days. Uh, so Troy Fatanu, they talked about the combine. They sent a position coach to his and then they were he was a top 30 visit uh, to Lisa Fuaga. They talked to him at the senior bowl and sent someone to his pro day out at Oregon State. Uh, he was a top 30 visit. But other people who have had the Steelers, the top brass at their com- at their uh, at their uh, their pro day and were talked to the com- combine. Uh, big names, Terry on Arnold, who some people have as the top cornerback in this class, uh, and also his cornerback partner, Kool-Aid McKinstry. Both of them were interviews at the Combine and the Steelers, you know, top brass. Make sure they make sure to go to Alabama's pro day so yeah. they could be two people brought in. But also guys like Rook Ororo, the defensive lineman out of Clemson, has both of those. And it just makes me wonder who else gets that kind of uh England here and you know you brought up linebacker Jeremiah Trotter is another player who they've taken a closer look at as well as Junior Colson so there's some interesting picks here. now neither Colson nor Trotter are first round picks but right. that could also kind of still hint that hey the Steelers even though they signed Patrick Queen maybe they still want to do add a young linebacker because as we've talked about we're not so sure about the status of Cole Holcomb moving forward right yeah I mean it, it's interesting how you um how you break that down that was certainly the case for Kevin Colbert and Mike Tomlin mm-hmm. when they worked together for all those years. And um, really, when you look at it last year, too, um, 
even beyond the first round, Chris, um, a lot of the guys that they drafted, they also went to their pro days and they had those guys in for top 30 visits too. So it certainly seems like, you know, one year is it's a very small sample size, but it seems like Omar Khan and Andy White will kind of have that same philosophy. So we'll see how it, it plays out now. You know, the two things I'm keeping an eye on, um, I, I want to see if the other two top centers come in this week. Graham Barton out of Duke. Um, Arthur Smith was at his pro day, not the top mm. brass, but um, Arthur Smith was. He kind of took that Carolina tour, also went to the Tar Heels pro day. And uh, Cedric Van Prahn, you know, Ranger. Van Prahn Ranger uh, is a Georgia guy. We all know how the Steelers – Love to, uh, uh, you know, scout Georgia guys. I'll be interested as, to see if he's one of those final visits as well. Mm-hmm. But um, it, it's going to be interesting. I, I think it, the one thing that I'm certain of, Chris, if you look at it, they're not trying to pull the wool over anyone's eyes with these visits. You know, they're not what, – what they're doing, um, I'm not going to say they're telegraphing what they're going to do because they can go in a number of different directions, but they're not trying to hide anything. We all know they need tackles, centers, receivers, and corners, and that's exactly who they've been targeting here over the last couple of weeks. That That's the thing here is that, you know, I think the good thing, though, is that even though they are we, – we, we are we are seeing, like, hey, they're prioritizing it. And some years they've, they've telegraphed that. Like, everyone very much knew they wanted Najee Harris. Like, that was, that was no, no, nobody's secret when they picked him. It was like, well, that's the guy that they were zeroing in on. Um, but I think the thing is, is that with these classes, they yeah, they want a center, they want a tackle, they want a corner, they they also want a wide receiver. But these are some deep classes at three of those four positions that we just named. So it's not a guarantee who they might pick of each of these classes. Also, because we're not a hundred percent sure how these classes will break down, how other people see them. Like there's right. some people who see Ola Fashanu of uh, uh or Fashanu of of Penn State as the number two tackle, but there's some people are saying, ah, maybe not as much because his hands are a little small and they're not sure if he's a, he's a true run blocker. Maybe he's, maybe he's the third or fourth tackle in this class. And like, that's a guy that if the Steelers draft him, it's like, well, he was projected to be like a a Supreme left tackle in the NFL. You could say, all right, Broderick, I know we said we're moving you to left, but that's our new left tackle. You're going to stick it right. And you're going to be the road grader over there. That's the thing is that, that it could go that direction. Fuaga could fall to them. Latham could fall to them or none of them because maybe the tackles just get run on early. And then all of a sudden, one of these other positions open, maybe cornerback, you can get Terry on Arnold, who some people have as the best cornerback in this draft class or Quinion Mitchell or anyway. And that's the thing I think that is really good for the Steelers is that with all these deep classes at positions of need and positions of value in the NFL, there, there are, there is not a way that I think that they can be locked into having to take a a position of need that takes them out of their val, takes them out of uh, drafting out of side of their value like they did with Artie Burns and other guys in the past. Yeah, one thing for fans to keep an eye on next week as as the draft approaches, and specifically on on the first day of the draft, we all know how the Steelers go about their business. But if you look at the other thirty one teams in the NFL, right? Um, quarterbacks always get pushed up draft boards. So yes. what you want to watch next Thursday night, does McCarthy go in the top 10 or 15? That would be tremendous for the Steelers, right? Because mm-hmm. that's a, another receiver, tackle, or center who is dropping to them. Does Penix come out of nowhere? And does he also get drafted in the top 20, perhaps opening up another space? Okay, so quarterbacks are usually the first to get pushed up draft boards and not always because they provide that value, um, just because it's the position, it's the most important position in the NFL when teams feel like they need a guy there, okay? The second most um, valuable position when you look at it from the NFL, really, over the years, it's been offensive line, okay? Mm-hmm. So whether it's left tackle, right tackle, not really guards or centers, but that tackle position is really the next the, – the, those guys usually move fairly fast, especially if there's a – a very good class. I think you'll see those guys come off the board next. So how does it pan out for the Steelers? You know, this is a great receivers class, probably going to be three in the top 15 go off the board, probably a couple of edge rushers off the board. So it's just a matter of the numbers game. But the one thing I want fans to keep an eye on, keep an eye on McCarthy and Penix. If those guys go before the Steelers draft at 20, it's going to be good news for the Steelers. Absolutely. That's the other part of this. Like you said, 
people get crazy over quarterbacks, and that can lead to madness here. Uh, we were talking about that. I was talking about this with Brian on the Friday podcast when he did the best case scenario. There's a chance that five quarterbacks can be drafted before the Steelers. So if you take five quarterbacks, that means there can only be 15 position players selected there. And then that that's including at least the top three wide receivers, uh, Marvin Harrison Jr., Malik Neighbors, Roma Dunze. So now you're talking about eight. That means only 12 other picks there. So right. – you know, that limits how many other things that can be taken there. And you know that there's going to be some edge rushers thrown up in there. You know that there might be a defensive lineman or two, which means at some point, one of these other top corners, tackles, or wide receivers, or, you know, maybe the, you know, the, the center position is completely un- untouched. They will get their best, a really great chance at 20th overall to get one really high-ranked player at one of these key positions. Absolutely. They, they are in good position with this draft being – very good at positions of their need. They are in very good position to draft the best player available at a position of need for them. So um, listen, their top tackles might be off the board, but maybe it's a receiver, maybe it's a corner. They will have plenty to choose from when they pick at number 20. If of course they stand pat and they don't trade up. Absolutely. He's Ray Fittipaldo, one of our great Steelers beat writers here at the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. Read all his work at post-gazette.com. we got to take a quick break. When we come back, I've got Noah Hiles talking about Andrew McCutcheon's 300th home run, the special moment that that was, and the 9-2 win that, that, that capped the weekend and how the Pirates get ready to take on the New York Mets. All that here and more on the North Shore Drive podcast from the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. But first, I'll remind you, this show is brought to you by Mike's Beer Bar. It's the best bar in all of Pittsburgh. When you go to Mike's Beer Bar, it's right on Federal Street, across the street from PNC Park. It's the best place to go before your Pirates games, if you're coming into town to enjoy a buck, enjoy the buckles at home or after a Pirates game, or if they're out of town, go there to watch it while you're there. You're going to be there with real Pirates fans right in the in the heart of the North Shore. And while you're there, you're experiencing over 500 different available beers. 300 of those beers are from the local Pittsburgh area, and 80 of those local beers are available on tap, and they're always switching new ones in and out, so you can always get new experience from all the great microbreweries of Western Pennsylvania. Plus, they have over 20 televisions, so if you don't even want to just enjoy baseball, NHL playoffs are coming, NBA playoffs are coming there's so much sports action going on right now go there enjoy that also a reminder we're going to be there the pittsburgh post gazette on the night of the draft starting with april 25th that thursday so get there next thursday for the live draft show where myself and other writers of the post gazette will be doing a live show reacting to every single pick including the pittsburgh steelers and it will be a great evening there join us there they have amazing food options like steak on a stone you gotta get there it's mike's beer bar the best bar in all of pittsburgh go today and when you get there tell them chris sent you We're back here on the North Shore Drive podcast. I'm your host, Chris Carter. We switch over to the Pirates. Noah Hiles, our our, our Pittsburgh Pirates beat writer, who has been on the road. And actually, as you're probably listening to this or watching this, he's going to be in New York by this time because he's got to travel to cover the Mets. But the Buccos were able to take down the Philadelphia Phillies 9-2. to There was a lot of action going on there. But the big story of the game was, of course, Andrew McCutcheon hitting his 300th home run. Noah, you were there for the vibes of it, the experience of it, and that a Pirates fan caught the ball in the stands. Right. I want you to walk everyone through just – kind of what this moment meant for, for McCutcheon, for the Pirates, and what it meant for the fans who got that experience. I like the order that you put that in because the person this meant the least to was Andrew McCutcheon. Uh, <laughs> the The only thing that he took away from this, aside from the baseball that he hit, and which we'll get into that in a little bit, was that he doesn't have this le- looming over him uh, anymore. I, I think uh, Andrew McCutcheon is at his absolute worst when a milestone is hanging over his head. Mm-hmm. I think we can all remember last summer how long it took him to get that 2,000th hit. You know, there was like that 10-game homestand. And to be fair, he was more productive in those ser- in those games. He was just drawing a million walks. No one wanted to throw him a good pitch <laughs> over the plate. Um, but here, yeah, I, I do think just the – the discussion around number 300 bothered him a little bit. He even said as much. He's like, I, I'm, I'm when stuff like this is happening, he's like, he said, I'm, I'm not watching MLB network or ESPN. I don't want to see the ticker. I don't want to see who's coming up on the schedule or who's pitching. I just need to know what we're doing that day. I try to go day by day. And when people are asking me about another career milestone or when it's the only thing connected to me, it's very tough to deal with. And he's like, so, I'm happy about it, but he's like, I'm ready for tomorrow to just get ready to play the New York Mets because that's what I've done for 15 years as a major league baseball player is show up to the ballpark every day and get ready to compete, not 
you know, etch another, you know, however many great achievements he's had into a, a long story career. So it meant the less, least to him to, then we'll go up on the hierarchy now for the pirates. I think it did mean a lot. I mean, this is a, a reason why he was brought back. I, I mean, I, I don't think they would have re-signed him if they didn't think, you know, he could come back and be a producer, but mm-hmm. let's not sit here and pretend like the, the history element, the milestone element to Andrew McCutcheon this season wasn't a playing factor in, in, in having him return. I think that's why the reunion itself occurred in 2023 when they knew, hey, this guy's not far away from 2,000 hits. He's not far away from 300 home runs. And boy, would it be nice for him to do these things in a Pirates uniform. He said after the game, I would have liked to hit all of my home runs and mm-hmm. base hits in a Pirates uniform. But it just wasn't in the cards that way. But I, I think that, yes, the Pirates are happy – uh, that he could do this in a pirate's uniform. And, and, and like what Andrew said, they're happy that it's now in the rear view mirror. It was a great moment. Um, and it's something that, you know, it, it was a, it was a cool, cool story to follow along with. And they're, they're happy that it's over with. And Andrew can kind of just get back to being Andrew. Um, mm-hmm. And I, I will say before we get to the family part of it, another cool element of this is um, if it weren't to happen in PNC park, I'm glad that this happened at Citizens Bank Park because this is where he's played the mm-hmm. most years of his career aside from as a pirate. He played a lot of years here in Philadelphia as well. And every bat, Chris, that he had this mm. this uh, series, he got an ovation. People were happy to have him back. And That's he cool. he talked about that. He said, um, you know, he's like, I was making $20 million here. And there were some seasons where I was not worth $20 million. And mm. the fact that these people can still appreciate me uh, means a lot. And Derek Shelton says, how many people do you know will get a standing O in Pittsburgh and Philadelphia? Not many. And that just goes to show what Andrew McCutcheon means to the game of baseball. Um, so now we get into the final, the biggest winners from number 300. And it's, <laughs> it's a family um, from the Philadelphia area. The dad's name is uh, Vinay and the son's name is uh, Torin. Um, 46 year old, uh, Greensburg native lives in the Philadelphia area now. And his son, Torin, uh, they're sitting in the seats in left field. It's the ninth inning. It's a blowout game. Props to them for even sticking around. Um, and Andrew McCutcheon hits an absolute nuclear missile off his bat. <laughs> I don't know if you saw the replay, but I, I mean, did. Yeah. He, he get off the bat. I was like, That's- yeah. And, and I, I, as someone who had to write, two extra stories from this that I wasn't expecting <laughs> added on to my work. Day. I was like, it, it would be cool if he didn't hit this right now. But then when it happened, I was like, all right, we're doing it. Here we go. Um, so yeah, the, it's crazy enough. Torin is a nine year old kid. He's sitting there the ball comes flying, hits him on the brim of his hat. Wow. Uh, yeah. Think about it. If he has his hat backwards. This isn't a good story. He, no, he's not. probably in the hospital right now. Cause it was a hunter. It was like 99 miles an hour off of his bat. So uh, but it hits the brim of his hat, bounces off, lands in his dad's hands. They catch it. They just think it's another home run. They don't. They weren't aware that it was oh, wow. number three hundred. Um, eventually, Philly fans were telling him to throw it back. They were like, "No." Um, and then Philly's employees came up. They told him what had happened. They connected him with Pirates PR, and that's where I got to meet uh, these two. We're heading down to the clubhouse after the game and standing. In front of the doors are, uh, are are these two, this, this family. And they were just saying, you know, I was, I asked the little guy and there's a video you can check out on X uh, that I posted or at post-gazette.com. I said, you know, what are your demands? What are you asking for? <laughs> and he said, I just want to give him the ball, you know? And it was so like nice. the cutest thing in the world. He said, maybe an autographed ball or just, yeah. you know, like a picture with him, but that's all I want. I just want to, you know, and like, that's just so cool because you see so many times now in our society and you know what, you can do whatever you want. If you catch the ball, sure. If you want to shake a guy down for a couple grand or whatever, that's, that's your prerogative, do what you got to do. But this was really cool that the fact that they just wanted to give Andrew McCutcheon the ball in person and he made sure they didn't leave empty handed. He signed a bat and gave it to him, took a that's whole bunch great. of pictures with the kid. He's like, I hooked him up and cut his quote about this was great. I want to read it to you here. Yeah. Um, because I asked him, I said, what was, what was the little guy's demands and how did you hook him up? He said, honestly, one of the best re- reactions I could have gotten from a family, the dad and the son, it was very genuine. 
They didn't want much. They didn't want anything. They just wanted to give me the ball. I was appreciative of that. It makes you want to do more for people as opposed to people who want the moon and rightfully so. For him, he just wanted to give it to me. Obviously, I had to hook him up a little bit. It makes you want to do more. It was cool being able to meet him. Him and his dad seemed like very genuine people. It was a nice little surprise for us. And that's just really cool. Um, you knew Kutch was going to take care of the guy regardless. And there's, it, it was just a really nice ending to what was a really good day for the Pittsburgh Pirates, a very impressive win over a very good Phillies team. Absolutely. And Andrew McCutcheon now tied with Phillies legend Chuck Klein in all-time home runs at, three, <laughs> at 300. There, there uh, you go. Th that, that also there. But let's talk about the Pirates real quick before we got to move on. Uh, they've now split their last two series with the Tigers and the Phillies. Now they face they face the Mets, but they're still tied for first place in their division. Yeah. They're still playing really well. And I saw a really good interest, uh, a really good point there. Uh, um, you know, you know on, on television earlier where they were recapping the game and people were asking like, is this just the same thing as last? Year? And they said, well, here's a few things that are different. One, they're hitting a lot better. Two, they're pitching significantly better. And last year at this time when they, they were just a like, two games back of where they were now their run differential was, was in the negative. Whereas yeah. this time, they're far in the positive. So <laughs> yes. it's not like they're eking by some games and getting destroyed in others. They are playing good good competitive baseball right now. Yeah, um, and, and I think that unlike last year where I think they were playing above their potential, I, I think that this team isn't playing anywhere near as good as it probably can be. I think mm -hmm. one of the best elements to this team is its defense. And quite frankly, through 16 games, this team's defense has been very bad. Cabrian Hayes has made a ton of errors, which just doesn't happen. And it's not going to continue to happen, but he's making a lot of errors. And uh, Michael A. Taylor, a gold glove center fielder that they acquired, has twice been on the wrong end of miscommunications with his fellow outfielders and allowed a ball to fall in for extra bases. Um you know, these things, they happen to teams in April, but normally they cost you ball games. And the fact that they're winning in spite of these things, Carter, that's significant. Uh, the yeah. fact that their pitching is really good without the best pitcher in their organization currently on the team, that's significant. Um, and, and, and I think that, you know, some of the shortcomings we've seen too, um, be it, you know, David Bednar or, mm -hmm. you know, Henry Davis or, or uh, Jack Sawinski, you know, guys or even Kutch who, who haven't been great. They they show flashes of like, hey, we're gonna figure this out. Don't you worry. Like David Bednar's save uh Friday was huge for him to come back and bounce back like that. That looked like the David Bednar that we've seen for the last two years. Andrew McCutcheon, if he can um, I mean, I'm not gonna expect him to hit, go two for five with a home run every game. Uh, <laughs> but if he can if he can draw long counts and, and and get back to drawing blocks like he's always been able to and and put some good swings on a ball and not just kind of be you know, someone who comes up to the plate and you're like, oh man, can he even get on base today? Which has been the case. That's going to help. Jack Sawinski's grand slam was huge today. Henry mm -hmm. Davis, I think, has been pretty good defensively. And if the back gets going, there you go. And Joey Bart's been a nice surprise to compliment D uh, Davis behind the plate. So I'm not completely sold on this team. I still think it's around a 500 uh, level talent-wise right now. But I think there are things here that could make it better. And if you if you add into the equation Quinn Priester, who might be coming up soon, and 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 Paul Skeens, who will eventually be up, and even Domingo Herman, uh, who will be up midseason. I mean, those are three notable additions to your starting rotation. And the lineup, I mean, there's going to be guys who continue to develop power-wise over the over the season. I mean, I don't think Cabrian Hayes even has a home run yet. That's going to change. So stuff like that, it's 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 encouraging. I think they're checking a lot more boxes, whereas opposed to last year, they were winning by stealing bases and playing small ball and you know, that sort of baseball isn't sustainable in today's game for 162. The way they're playing now is a little bit more sustainable. Absolutely. He's Noah Hiles at underscore Noah Hiles on Twitter slash X to get his stuff there. Read all his work at post-gazette.com. The Pirates come, come, are now in New York Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Three games there before they're back home for the homestand against the Red Sox and the Brewers. Get all of Noah's work there. We're going to switch it to the Penguins. They have a playoff push. It is there in the thick of it. We talk with Matt Bensel about the Pens and their chances to make the playoffs right after this.
Back here on the Monday edition of the North Shore Drive podcast, I'm your host, Chris Carter, with the Post-Gazette. We turn to Andrew Destin. I know I said Matt Venzel, but we had some schedule conflicts, uh, so we had to switch things up. But Andrew was at the morning skate for the Pittsburgh Penguins, and the Penguins are in a do-or-die situation. They need to at least get a point tonight in their in their in their matchup with Nashville at home and then they go on the road to play the Islanders here but Andrew I need you to break down for us just what the situation is for the Penguins there's only one more spot left in the in the Eastern Conference for the playoffs and it seems like there's four teams going after it right now yeah I mean that's exactly what it is Chris glad to be on here and talk it through because that's pretty much what we've spent the last week doing is running the numbers (laughs) crunching the teams and uh, the reality, just to set it in stone here, right? Okay, so looking at the Eastern Conference, the Penguins falling in that game on Saturday against the Bruins uh, in regulation, of course, didn't pick up any points. So they're now at 86 points in 80 games with two to go. Ahead of them are the Flyers, who the Penguins have a game in hand on. The Flyers have 81 games played and 87 points. Both the Red Wings and the Capitals also have 87 points. But that's in 80. So the Capitals, Red Wings, Flyers, and Penguins, the four teams still in contention, The Penguins have the head-to-head over all three of those teams in terms of regular season. So if we end at 82 games and all those teams are tied up or the Penguins are tied up with any one of those teams, then the Penguins would get in by virtue of the head-to-head. However, the problem is they need to probably get two points in regular – probably need to get a regulation win tonight. That would help. If they only get a point in overtime, that really makes things difficult for that Long Island game. And the reality is with the Capitals and the Flyers and the Red Wings, just based on those matchups, Capitals playing the Flyers – um, if the Capitals are to win in regulation uh, over the Flyers, that would probably sink the Flyers. Uh, it, you know, it, Actually, it would. The Flyers would be done because then uh, they'd be at 87 points. They're toast. Um, but the reality is the Penguins just need to win out. They just need to control what they can control, which is get four points of the remaining four points and see where that lands them. The problem is that by losing to Boston, that's really kind of dug them in a tough spot here where the odds are once again kind of stacked against them. That's the thing is that, Pit or the, the, the Penguins, they are in a position where they have they have to at least get a point in this game because of everyone else. And it also it kind of it kind of works against them that the Flyers and the Capitals play each other, where it's like, okay, yeah, one of them will lose, but at the end of the day, one of them gets points from 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 that. And it's kind of like because Philly is in the position only has one game left, you need them to lose. That is there a possible way that uh that, that it could work out if the if the Flyers if the Flyers win, but the Capitals get a point, what you know, and that goes that goes to overtime. What does that do for the Penguins' chances? Yeah, I mean, that makes things. I, I would have to imagine I don't have the formulas in front of me. I'm no math major these days, but um, <laughs> in terms of what it would do for them, Flyers would be at 89 points, finish out the regular season with that, um, and you're assuming that the Capitals would lose in regulation. That's correct, right? Yes. Okay. So if the Capitals lose in regulation, then the best they could do is match the Flyers at 89 points if they win their season finale. For the Penguins, you could pass either of those teams, and that would work to their benefit if you get the remaining four points or if you just get three of four points. But there's also the factor of the Detroit Red Wings, who are currently sitting uh, you know, at 87 points. With 80, they've got the most favorable of the remaining schedules because they're playing against a lowly Montreal Canadiens team. Yeah. Um, believe that one, the puck drop for that is tonight. And then they wrap up the season with another one against the the Habs uh, on on the 16th, which I believe that is uh, Tuesday. Um, mm. Yeah, I got that right. So, you know, Montreal's not a good team. Detroit has the easiest path of any of the teams. Um, so certainly it would be good for the Penguins' sake um, if the Capitals are the team that loses this game between the Flyers and the Caps. Uh, but the reality is that they just need things to kind of play out in a manner where everybody is kind of trading points or losing in, regu- in overtime or losing in regulation. However it works out, the Red Wings are probably the team that I'm most concerned about if I'm a Penguins fan, just given who they're playing and the potential for points that they have. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you're right. I mean, they're, you're playing. You're playing. The Canadians have nothing to play for. They're they, they're near the bottom of the. Uh, uh, they they can't do anything. So you, they kind of need they kind of need the, at least some help from from a team that has nothing really to play for at that point. And that's a tough position to be in, especially with with the Red Wings there. But if, so even if so, basically even even if they lose a, one of those games, the Red Wings that being. But in, in overtime, if the Penguins handle their business and get all four of their points, they can catch them in that scenario. scenario. Yes. The way that they do they catch the Red Wings is Detroit loses one of those two games in you know regulation or overtime. Doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. If they only get three points, they get to 90, and the Penguins match that and get to 90 themselves, then the Penguins are in, assuming those are the only teams that would get to 90 points, of course. 
um, just by virtue of how they've done head to head this season. So at least the Penguins have that in their favor, but they need help. Well, let's look at the games that are in front of the Penguins themselves because you can't, you know, they they can't worry about what other teams do if they don't handle their business. They're playing, uh, they're they're playing Nashville at home, and then the Islanders on the road. How do you see them matching up against those two teams heading into heading into this week? Yeah, the way I look at it is that uh, this Predators team is such a fascinating one uh, coming out of the Western Conference. They were one that was kind of left for dead, not too dissimilar from the Penguins um, in some regards, just given that going into the trade deadline, they weren't a team that most people considered a playoff team. Um, and they've gone in an absolute tear the last month and change and are now a playoff team. Uh, they've clinched their spot. They're going to be one of the wild card teams. They got one of the best goalies in hockey in Yusei Saros. Um, he's an undersized guy, but really an excellent netminder for the Predators. So mm -hmm. um, they're going to need to get a couple of goals. Uh, it's not going to be easy. It's a good defensive team with guys like Roman Yossi. I mean, it's a it's a good squad. The reality is this is a tough end to the season for the Penguins. Um, playing the Bruins, of course, like they did this past Saturday and the Predators. Um, those were going to be when you looked at this four game stretch, once the Penguins had inched back into a playoff spot for a brief time. These were the two games that most people circle on the calendar saying these are going to be the toughest, even though they're at home. Now, mm. one factor to consider is what does Nashville have to play for, right? They've already locked up a spot. They can't really bump themselves up anymore. Um, when you look at the Western Conference table, which doesn't you know impact Penguins fans that much. But for the topic of this discussion, it's interesting because I'm curious, how do they deploy their lines? How do they use their defensemen? You know, how are they going to divvy up those minutes? Does Saros play the whole game? I imagine he will. But, you know, it's just a matter of how motivated is this Nashville team? Now, Penguins need to attack. They need to get on the rush. They need to make you know the most that they can offensively, uh, especially with those top two lines. Um, I'm curious if we get Jansen Harkins back. He was at the morning skate um, and said he's cleared to go and ready to go if needed. Mike Sullivan said he would play. And, of course, we're leaving the elephant out of the room. Uh, Alex Ndalkovich is in net for the Penguins. I really buried the lead that time. But uh, <laughs> starting his 12th straight game, uh, Mike Sullivan's rolling with him. Talked about how he's helped the team win a bunch of games. That's the direction they went went with rather than Tristan Jari, who relieved Al a tired-looking Alex Ndalkovich on Saturday. So um, curious what kind of net mining the Penguins get. And curious what the Predators get, uh, what we see from the Predators, rather, from a team that has, you know, mixed motivation, I guess you could put it. That's that, that's the thing is that, like you said, their their position right now, like the Predators, they're locked. They're locked in in the West. They don't got to worry about anything. They've got a wild card spot. You know, how, how much do they want? How much do they, they actually want to get, you know? Put you know commit to the team into this game, but it's also you, you're still wanting to head into the playoffs to their playoffs hot. I think the Penguins. You look at this situation. It, it's kind of a you need to handle your own business and then just wait for everyone. Wait for everyone else. But you, it doesn't matter if they lose either of these either of these games or if they don't get a, if they don't at least get a point in either of these games. That kind of puts them in a near near impossible situation where they would need all every everything to go right in their situation. And even now, with outlet, let's say they get three points, that still puts them in a spot where they need one of these teams to not reach ninety. The only thing that's in their favor is that they have the tiebreaker scenarios over all three of these teams. And but again, with all three of the eighty-seven points, and you're sitting at eighty-six something has to give there for the penguins to be able to jump jump at least to tie uh to tie the the one team of these three that ends up on top. Yeah, and it would probably help the Penguins' case if they got some production from some areas that they haven't really all season. Um, a power play that's 31st in the league, if that sprung to life once or twice tonight. Uh, we're recording this, of course, Monday. Uh, you know, that would be beneficial to the Penguins. Um, if Alex Nelkovich can stand on his head like he did during a stretch where the Penguins went 7-0-3, um, that would certainly benefit the team. Um, you know, but like you said, it's... They need to focus on themselves. They're, you know, that's been the motivation. That's been the approach, really, for the last month. Has been even when the odds were so low. I believe it was after they lost to the Avalanche on the twenty fourth back in March that we had some, you know, operations or some services that were saying the Penguins had less than a two percent chance of making the playoffs. Um, it's not high right now, but they've inched back into this fight before they're here. So it's just a matter of what can you get in net. Can you get some timely scoring? Can the bottom six chip in maybe? It's a lot to ask. It's a good team they're playing against in Nashville, but they still have everything to play for, which if you had asked me that question three weeks ago, I would have laughed you off a cliff. <laughs> <laughs> and that's I think that's the blessing here, right? Is that yeah. you know, not too long ago, 
the Penguins were, were dead and done. Everyone was just talking about the misery of the upcoming offseason, and it's going to be so sad. But now there's at least hope there. We'll see if they achieve that hope when the Penguins take on the, the Predators. If they can if they can get at least a point in this game, it keeps their playoff hopes alive. But that's what most Pittsburgh fans need to be rooting for, is at least getting to overtime to keep the dream alive of getting back in the playoffs and avoiding back-to-back years of missing the playoffs. He's Andrew Destin of the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette. Uh, make sure you read him and Matt Vensel's work as they continue to cover the Penguins' push to the playoffs at post-gazette.com find all of our podcasts on our on your favorite podcasting apps and on youtube by searching post gazette sports thanks again everyone for tuning, tuning in we're back wednesday here in the north shore drive podcast but don't forget it's all there's all daily like, there's daily content every single day from our post gazette writers we'll see you again here right here from the pittsburgh post gazette thank you for tuning in to another episode of the north shore drive podcast from the pittsburgh post gazette if you watch this video on youtube please like the video and subscribe to our channel For all the sports coverage from the Post-Gazette that we have to offer, visit post-gazette.com.